Well, hello, church, and if you would, open to John 18. John 18, I'm going to read through into chapter 19. We'll start in verse 33 again as we've been the last few weeks, but we'll read on to chapter 19 all the way to verse 11. This is the word of God. It says, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you're a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him for yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. According to that law, He ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Father, what a moment. What a moment in redemptive history that we get to study. What a privilege to read these words. To take this time right now and to think about what all of this means. And so we need you, Holy Spirit, to give us understanding. You are the teacher. You are the instructor. You are the counselor. We pray for illumination. We pray for understanding. We pray for clarity. And Lord, beyond that, we pray that you would change us by these things. That we would live for the one who who is the King and is the Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is uh, actually our sixth week studying Jesus' trial. If you remember, we, we looked first at those first three trials that Jesus had before the Jews. Uh, he stood before Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, and he stood before the Sanhedrin before they said, uh, we, we can't kill him. Uh, We want Rome to kill him. And so they waited till the morning and they went to the praetorium, the the governor, Roman government headquarters, and they handed Jesus over to Pilate and said, you need to kill this man. 
Uh, so he meets before Pilate, first trial, it was really the fourth trial, the fifth trials before Herod, and then Herod hands them back over to Pilate for the sixth and final trial. And um, you can even sense as I read that there's a shift in Pilate, isn't there? At first, he's very clearly mocking Christ, but then by the end, he's almost, he's saying, I'm washing my hands of him. This man is something different than a criminal that I want to be guilty of putting to death. And he's, he's fearing uh, the man standing before him. It's led actually to some confusion. I don't know how many of you have studied up on this. Pilate, uh, as, a, as a person, um, and especially in this moment, there's a new book that was written recently, I was reading it this week, um, talking about, uh, it's from a Hebraic, uh, Hebraic scholar and, uh, and, and historian who's basically trying to argue, it's called The Innocence of Pontius Pilate, How the Lonely Trial of Jesus Shaped History. And so there's two kind of things that this guy's arguing. One, he's trying to argue that Pilate's innocent, which doesn't convince me uh, that that's the case. Pilate seems quite guilty. Uh, but the other thing he's trying to argue is that this trial between Jesus and, and Pilate here shaped all of the judicial system in every Western culture and in every culture throughout the rest of time. That this is that significant of a moment when it comes to politics, government, the judicial systems of different nations, that it's influenced and shaped all of them. And uh, interesting, very interesting book. What I want to do uh, today, I'll just give you the title because there's kind of a threefold aim that I have in this sermon. Um, so I titled it Lordship, Compatibilism, and Tyrannical Governments. And they kind of build on each other. So we'll start with lordship, we'll go to compatibilism, and then we'll go to tyrannical governments. And, and the text kind of builds as we go. But I want to start by uh, clarifying what I mean by lordship. Because some of you even hearing that word lord, I, I used it last week a lot, I'm now saying it. Like, where is that in the text? In this text? Because this text keeps saying the word king. King, 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 king. That's what we keep hearing, and I'm calling this Lord. Um, and the reason I do that is, is because uh, the rest of the Bible onward, often the, the dominant thing Jesus is called is not king, but Lord. And even kingdom is used a few other times in the New Testament, but even kingdom is replaced with church. Not that the kingdom and the church are identical, they're not. The church is kind of a preview of, of the kingdom of God, uh, a microcosm of, of the larger kingdom that Christ is building. Um, so uh, Jesus goes from, after his resurrection, he's, he's king of kings and lord of lords, and the lordship part is emphasized most strongly. That's why last week in, uh, I brought up some different passages, like Romans 10, 9, that says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that lordship is emphasized there, and even the need to confess that lordship. And I, I just want to I want to unpack this for just a second, at a, at a, because I don't many of the backgrounds here that idea of Jesus being Lord in many of our upbringings that was used at a time of an altar call where, where a preacher would say something like, are you ready to make Jesus Lord of your life? We've heard this phrase. And I, I just want to clarify something. Uh, you don't make Jesus Lord of your life. He is Lord of your life. Whether you realize that or not, He is Lord of your life. And... If a 15-year-old boy or an 8-year-old girl or a 47-year-old man or woman makes Jesus Lord of their life, I submit to you that the Lord is not the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is that person who just in that moment made Jesus Lord. That decisive moment, they made Jesus Lord. Who's the Lord? Who's the Lord in that moment? Um, it, it is not the Lord, it is that person. And now, I, to be fair, not everybody means the same thing when they use this terminology. Some people actually do mean uh, that man's will is Lord, sovereign Lord. 
And they really mean that. Okay, But there's others who have picked up some bad terminology. And if you press them on this, and you go, do you really mean that you know, someone is actually Lord over the Lord and they're making him Lord? And they would go, no, no, that's not what I mean. I mean that someone must come to a point where they bow the knee. They submit, they surrender to Christ as Lord. They no longer rebel against his lordship, but they joyfully come up under it. And then I go, amen, that's what I mean too. That's what I think the Bible means. But Jesus is Lord and there's debate, some of y'all know the Lord, it's called the Lordship Debates. The last 20 or 30 years there's been some debate because there's some, been some bad teaching that some will say, there, when you get saved, you can actually have Jesus as your Savior, but He isn't necessarily your Lord. So some people have a theology where they think someone can get saved, their sins forgiven, but it may be years down the line before that person finally makes Jesus Lord of their life. And many pushed back on this rightly and said, whoa, 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 if Jesus, has, if Jesus is your Savior, He's your Lord. You don't pick the, between those two. If He's Savior, He's Lord, because when He's Savior and forgives our sins, He doesn't just forgive our sins. What does He do? He gives us His Spirit. And when the Spirit takes residence in the life of someone, what does he do? He takes control. He unpacks his bags and he gets things in order. He begins to even reorder their affections. Listen to Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit, capital S, my spirit within you and listen, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. When the Spirit takes residence, He causes that person to obey. That sounds like a Lord inside of them. Creating humility, creating submission in the life of that person. So everybody is under Christ's Lordship. They're either rebelling against that Lordship or they're surrendering joyfully to the goodness of being under Christ as Lord. But when Philippians chapter 2 says, uh, he has, God has exalted him and given him a name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? It means... Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And then in between those two, it says, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Under the earth? Hell? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We will do it now willfully, joyfully, of our own volitional will, we will bow before Christ, confess He is Lord unto heaven, that is the path of heaven, or we will do it later reluctantly. In hell, we will acknowledge He is Lord. But He is Lord, and every tongue will confess, and every knee will bow. Guys, this is the ultimate reality in the universe. Whether someone acknowledges it or not doesn't change the fact that he's Lord. So Pilate, who's speaking to Jesus and goes, what is truth? That doesn't change truth. It doesn't affect the truth. You can stand before a, a, a you know, chest out uh, full of confidence that this solar planet coming 100 million light years at you is not going to harm you, and you can mock it, and you can say, all, and it hits you, all right, you disintegrate into a dust that no one can find your ashes. It doesn't matter how confident you are that something doesn't exist. Christ is Lord. That reality is over everything. Jesus' lordship is the reality that sustains and governs all other realities. 
Do we realize that the laws of physics, the laws of gravity, all of science and and mathematical facts are true only if Jesus is Lord is true? Do we understand that Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, their epistemological and philosophical deductions about matter and life and the universe and existence, those things are only true if Jesus Christ as Lord is true. If Jesus isn't Lord, the universe literally and physically falls apart. You say, how can you say that, Pastor? Well, because I'm not saying it. God says it. In Hebrews 1.3, Christ upholds the universe by the word of His power. Christ upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and it goes on, Lord, Your throne... Or lordship, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth. In the beginning, the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment like a robe that that will be rolled up, like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? The Lordship of Christ being connected to all other things in the universe. Time, existence, eternity. He's over all of these things. So this is, the, this is the, the man, the God, the King, the Lord, standing before Pilate. This is who Pilate is dealing with. And, and let, me, let me just say really clearly, they're not taking his life, he's giving it. John 10, 17, Jesus says, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord because I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it back up again. And we know that in this moment in the garden right before he's handed over to be arrested, it says he stepped forward. John 18, 4, it says, knowing all that was about to happen to him, he stepped forward. He's not passive. Like the first Adam in the garden. Jesus is in the garden, the second Adam, stepping forward, taking initiative. Before this battalion of six to eight hundred Roman soldiers who had come to arrest him, and they, they're all walking in with their, uh, their, this armed militia of guards and this, this uh, tactically trained Roman guards coming in there with, with torches and weapons. And before they can say a word, Jesus speaks up first and says, Who do you seek? Whose name is on your arrest warrant? And, and then when Jesus says his name, they fall to the ground. It says they all fell. G. Campbell Morgan, I love this, and he, he was talking about John 18, 12, and it, it says that the soldiers came to bound Jesus. And he says this, bound him? They bound him. I never read it without laughing. Yes, they bound him, and see how many it took to do it? The Roman guards, the temple guards, the chief captain, all the police? They rushed at him and they bound him? They bound him. They thought they bound him. What did bind him? Love for me. Love for you. The will of the Father. That is what bound him. Guys, he's giving his life. They're not taking it. He's Lord. Not them. And I want to make sure we see this. Because this is... 
So important. Luke twenty-two, twenty-two. Listen, listen to how this is worded. Jesus says, The Son of Man goes, that is to death, as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. The Son of Man goes as it has been determined. So God has predestined that Jesus die on the cross for our sins. But woe to the man that betrays Him over to death. God sovereignly plans that Jesus die, but woe to the man who hands Him over to death. How does that work? We need to feel this tension. So, I love, it. I love one, of, one of the kids in the church came up to me, um, it was a, three or four weeks ago, and uh, after the service, I was, it was one of the ones we were talking about Judas, and he uh, pulled me aside and said, I don't like him. <laughs> and he meant it, and you could tell. I sat down with him for a little bit and we talked, and he did not like Judas. He was very bothered by this sadistic, devilish character, Judas, because he saw the innocence of Christ and he knew Christ did nothing wrong. Why is his friend treating him like this? We need to feel the evil of these men, Pilate, Judas, even what Peter did. We don't just carelessly look at that. Oh, it's part of God's plan. Well, it is, but it's evil. But yet it's part of God's plan, but it's evil. You feel that tension. And I said to the, this young boy that when we were sitting there, I said, but did Judas stop Jesus' work that he came to do? Did, did Pilate, and I ask this to us right now, did Pilate stop what Jesus came to do? Did the Jews crying out that he be crucified, stop what Jesus came to do. No, they helped accomplish it. Their evil, volitional acts of hatred and unbelief and pragmatism helped to accomplish God's salvific work in the death of his son. It all led to putting Jesus on that sacrificial altar of a Roman cross. The evil, the sin. It's part of the plan. God doesn't shift into plan B when, when Judas betrays him. Because Jesus says to Judas, do what you need to do. God planned that. What about when Peter denies Jesus three times? He's like, whoa, this is the lead, this is the guy supposed to be the leader to the church. As soon as Jesus goes, Peter's the guy. Now he's denied. What do I? No. Jesus said at the rooster crows the second time, you'll have denied me three times. That was the plan. The sin was part of the plan. This is how the Apostles understood these events. Listen to Acts 2, 23. So it's a few days after Jesus is resurrected and ascended to heaven. Peter stands up and says this. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you hear it? You crucified and killed lawlessly this innocent man. Yet, it was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. That's Peter in Acts 2. Look at Acts 4, 27. He says the same thing. There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, according with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to what? Do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. It doesn't say the evil against Jesus was allowed. God permitted it. It says it was predestined. It calls it His plan. His hand. Do you have a category for that? Theologically, biblically, can you, does, does that work in your mind? That's, how, that's what it says. 
In fact, this would help us if every Christian got this because this is the biggest argument that skeptics bring against Christianity is how does a sovereign good God allow evil and suffering? That's the biggest argument they have against us as far as I'm concerned. How does a sovereign and good God allow evil and suffering? And I love to tell people if they ask me that, I love to say, you're not making the question hard enough. A sovereign good God doesn't allow evil and suffering. He ordains it. It does. So how do we understand that? And and this is where the word compatibilism comes in. And what theologians call biblical compatibilism. So if you want to answer that question for someone, you can't merely work philosophically. You can't just work rationally. You can't work according to how you think this should or shouldn't work. You have to work biblically. Biblically is the only way you're going to give an adequate answer to them. So God accomplishes a good, sovereign plan through the evil, voluntary actions of fallen people. That's what we're suggesting. That's what the Bible is teaching. God accomplishes his good sovereign plan to save us through Jesus' death, but he's doing it through the voluntary, real evil of people. And some people, some Christians try to answer this with the, with the phrase free will. That's not the answer. Our wills aren't free. Our wills are enslaved. The answer is the freedom of man. The free agency of man is the answer that people actually do what they want and desire, even if it's sin, and God somehow under his sovereign plan works that according to his sovereign plan. We've seen this all through the Gospel of John. We've seen it in John 18 with Peter's denial and the roosters. We've seen it with Judas's greedy heart. So let's take Judas for an example. I have to back up. I'm saying something a little bit crazy here, and I have to back this up. Take Judas. Why did Judas betray Jesus? It says he was greedy and he wanted money. At one level, that's why he did it. 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. That's what he got for Jesus. And you go, okay, so he was greedy. Yeah, but then people will go, yeah, but it says the devil entered into him. So it's the devil's fault. Satan entered into his heart, and that's why he did what he did. Well, there's a problem with that. The problem with that is that it was prophesied hundreds of years earlier. In Zechariah 11, 12 and 13, Jesus was, would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and purchased the potter's field. That was prophesied beforehand, which tells us what? This is not according... Judas's will is not free, and neither is the devil's will free. They're both acting according to their own sinful desires, but under God's sovereign plan in what he wanted to accomplish through the death of Christ. Is this registering at all, the, the, the logic of this? Jesus is Lord. He really is. He's sovereign. He's Lord over all. And because that reality is true, even the fallen sinful actions of man, somehow in his divine wisdom, without him being guilty of sin or evil himself, through the evil actions of others, he accomplishes his plan as being Lord of all. And I want to now try to show us that in this tyrannical government that Jesus is standing before. So go to chapter 19, verse 10. He entered his headquarters, Pilate, again, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Jesus is reminding Pilate, you are under authority. 
You are not a sovereign authority. You have delegated authority. Remember what Romans 13.1 says, There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. It's talking about the government. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And he is God's servant. That is the government. The governing officials are called God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the, on the wrongdoer. So Pilate not only has authority to kill Jesus, he has divine authority. He has, God's, he has God-given authority to put Jesus to death. He's a servant of God, appointed and instituted by God, not for injustice, but for justice, for righteousness. So Pilate's not free to do whatever he wants with Jesus, because government leaders aren't free to do whatever they want. Governments are not free to do whatever they want. Governments are not their own autonomous institution allowed to be secular and evil with no consequence. How do we know that? Well, Psalms 2 makes this abundantly clear when it says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed It's interesting, uh, Peter also in Acts 4 quotes that verse and says that it's being fulfilled with Pilate before Jesus. And this is what these rulers say, let us burst their bonds and cast their cords from us. That is God's system of morality. God will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That's what God says to the rulers of this world. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So what am I getting at? I'm getting at accountability. Governments aren't free to make wicked laws without consequence. They will be held accountable. Governments are not sovereign lords of the secular state. They're under the king of Zion who is enthroned in his holy hill. Jesus is Lord of all governments. He is. And every governing official from the local to the state to the national level will give an account to him, including Pharaoh of Egypt for killing the firstborn sons, including King Nebuchadnezzar making laws to punish and put into the fire Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, including King Darius in Babylon who who threw uh, Daniel into the lion's den, When we read of the Apostle Paul, who says he endured imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death, five times he received at the hands of the Jews, forty lashes, lest one, three times beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Do you think those governing authorities won't stand and give an account for how they treated Paul? Hebrews 11, 35, speaks about the early first century Christians when it says they were tortured, they refused to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. Who did that to them? Mainly governments. And we talked about this last week with the martyrs and all the Christian martyrs that have died because they profess Jesus is Lord, not a human king or government. And they they died for that. 
So does Nero think that he won't give an account for killing all these early Christians in the Roman Empire? What about Emperor Domitian in AD 81 and 97 who began the violent persecution against Christians, boiling uh, the Apostle John in oil and then exiling him to the Isle of Patmos and approving in the city of Ephesus the, the beating of Timothy that led to his death? What about the Roman Emperor Trajan in AD 108 who inflicted torture and death in the third persecution in Rome against Christians? What about Marcus Aurelius in AD 162 who brought about the fourth persecution against Christians in Rome? What about Athanasius and how they treated him? Remember Athanasius? Lord bless the man in heaven now fighting for the deity of Christ against the heresy of Arianism basically single-handedly standing against everyone, being exiled five times under four different emperors? What about all the Protestant reformers who died under Queen Mary? Bloody Mary, we call her. Well, they not be... I mean, they, didn't, this wasn't, they weren't just messing with uh, pastors. They were killing children. They were killing, killing women. One of the f- most famous uh, Protestant reformers was a teenager, 17 years old, named Jane Grey, who stood face to face with King Henry VIII and died. And Queen Mary, she died under Queen Mary, who was actually her cousin. And before her execution she turned to the onlookers and said, do not, I do not look to be saved by any other means but by the mercy of God and the blood of His only Son, Jesus Christ. And out of all the passages that she could think to quote in that moment, she quoted Psalms 51 and said, be merciful to me, O God. And she was blindfolded and they put her head on the chopping block And she said, and to your hands I commend my spirit before they decapitated her. God's righteous judgment against these unrepentant leaders is described in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. When the fifth seal is opened, John says, he saw the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before You will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers would be complete who were to be killed, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. All their blood will be vindicated by Christ. All of it. That seventh trumpet will blow. Revelation eleven fifteen says, Loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. We long for that day. The kingdom of this fallen world will be redeemed and restored and become the kingdom of our God, and there will be no kingly opposition to His rule. But that day is not yet. And that day was not yet when Jesus stood before Pilate. He's standing before tyranny, looking it in the face. Which is what most Christians did who died for their faith. Because there's a handful of good leaders out there historically. And then many evil, power-hungry Abusers of power. You know, the norm historically is not humility when it comes to government leadership. It's power-hungry dictators. The norm historically is not truth-loving leaders, but tyrannical abusers of power who could care less about truth. Pilate doesn't care about truth. What is he saying? What is truth? 
He's a people-pleasing pragmatist. Like most politicians, right? People-pleasing pragmatism. Francis Schaeffer in 1980 used to say, wherever truth retreats, tyranny advances. Wherever truth retreats, tyranny advances. It's true in our own country. Pilate is like so many, and so many are like Pilate. They'll do whatever the angry mob tells them to do. They can know somebody's innocent. There's no proof of their guilt. But they, and they know that. This person's innocent. But what does the angry mob say? how most nations are ruled. If the angry mob, even as a minority, is loud enough and could affect their popularity or their chance of being re-elected, they'll cave to the mob and do even what is unjust for the sake of the mob. That's why abortion is still criminalized or not criminalized in so many states because, not because the science isn't there and we don't know it's a human life and it's really murder, not because of that, but because the angry mob is loud and threatens the political power structures. And so people fear the mob. This isn't new. Pilate's trying to save his job as Pontus of Rome. That's what he's doing. And, and the awesome irony is that even in the midst of his people-pleasing pragmatic decisions where he's just trying to think about his own job and career and not getting dethroned, God is working sovereignly through that to accomplish our salvation. I mean, the glory of that is is unbelievable. And the Jews know the position they're putting him in. So he's trying to pull these little PR spin moves. And look what the Jews do in verse 12. I'm in chapter 19, verse 12. The Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat, a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and Jesus said to the Jews, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? But the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. And Jesus is not intimidated by Pilate's authority over him. Pilate does have authority over him, but Jesus understands his his authority, his power, is the Lord's hand moving me to the Roman cross. He's comforted knowing that although he's in the hands of Pilate, he's not really in the hands of Pilate. He's in the hands of God. His loving Father, who he knows that the love of the Father doesn't mean that tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword won't come, but when they do, it won't separate from his love. And Jesus knows that. He knows he has enemies to conquer. And and Pilate is moving him to the cross where he has to destroy the enemies against his kingdom. And so Jesus goes. And he goes at this tyranny of Pilate and the Roman government. And I'm going to point out one last thing. And I'm going to take this time right now because I'm not preaching here for four more weeks. And this is glorious how this ends. So if you'll go back to chapter 18. And look at what Pilate does with Barabbas. Let's read verse 38. After he had said this, he went back outside to to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I shall release one man 
for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release for you, release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. Brilliant diplomatic plan, but it failed. Pilate thought, okay, this guy's a criminal. He's a robber. They don't want him on the streets. That's why he's arrested. Surely they will say, kill the robber, and then the man that's innocent, let him go free. That's Pilate's plan. This can get me out of trouble. This can appease them. They'll like this plan. They don't like the plan. Who should live, Barabbas or Jesus? And the irony is that this early scribal tradition identifies Barabbas as a name called Jesus Barabbas. So, does Jesus Barabbas, the criminal, go free? Or does Jesus of Nazareth, the innocent, go free? That's the question. It gets more ironic because Bar means son. So, Barabbas in Aramaic is son of the father. So, does son of the father, Jesus Barabbas, the criminal, go free? Or son of the father, Jesus of Nazareth, the innocent, go free? That's the decision. And they don't want the true Jesus. Because the world never does. Because when you put the true Jesus out there, people go, but he's a Lord. And that means I have to come under him. If we receive the Lord, we have to submit to the Lord. Give us Barabbas. Who won't give us any Standard. We can live however we want if we get Barabbas. Give us Jesus. We've got a Lord that we must deal with. He is a law. He is a standard. They fail to recognize Jesus is also the Savior. Here's the beauty and the glory of this. And we'll end with this as we go to the table. Um, Barabbas is really a picture of us, isn't he? He's a guilty sinner who deserves to die. That's you. That's me. Jesus is the innocent one who doesn't deserve to die, but goes to die in place of the one who deserved to die. Isn't that the gospel? Isn't it pictured in this? Guys, as we, as we prepare to go to the table, church, I, I, I want to remind you, as you go there, remember in these elements, we, we are proclaiming it is not our blood and it is not our body that had to die on the cross. It was His. That's a glorious truth. That's our only hope. Barabbas didn't die. Jesus died. And because he died, we can be saved. We can come under his lordship. For those of you who are new, if you're wondering if you can come to the table, uh, the question is, are you under his lordship? Yes, has he saved you from your sins? But is he also lord of your life? Have you followed and demonstrated that lordship through baptism and committing to his people? If so, the table is for you. As we're coming here and as we're praying and considering this, I just want us all, every, everybody here, if we would just, uh, and you can go ahead and close your eyes, uh, just remember Barabbas, a sinner set free. A sinner set free. And remember Jesus, the innocent dying in His place. Father, we praise You. You stepped forward, innocent, pure, spotless Lamb of God who can take away the sins of the world. We thank you for the picture of that in Barabbas, that a guilty criminal was set free. Even behind the evil of that moment, you were displaying something beautiful and glorious and good. 
And so, Father, as we go to the table, remind us of what you've done for us. Deepen our confidence in your substitutionary death and help us to go from here living and honoring you as Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a few moments and pray and then we'll come to the table.